Good morning and welcome to Leaving Ordinary and it is a delight to be back with you in person this week and we have been studying the labor. Obviously it's a beautiful picture of the Word of God, the living Word of God, Jesus Christ, who cleanses us, clothes us in His righteousness and the Word, the written Word that reveals to us just like that mirror that it was made out of. And as we dive in this morning, let's first go to the Lord and ask Him to give us spirit eyes and ears to hear. Heavenly Father, How we love you, and Lord, how we thank you. God, I thank you for this day, Lord. What a gift it is to be able to join here together with like-minded women who love you and love your word, and to be able to dig in and let you open our hearts and minds to truth. Lord, how I thank you that everything you have included in your written word is a beautiful picture that points to Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of all of it. And Lord, that in your word you have chosen to reveal yourself that we might know you, Because at your core, you are a relational God, and you have created us for relationship. Lord, we gather together today in the name of Jesus, and we ask you through your spirit to teach us. Lord, give us ears to hear, we pray. Meet with us, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, ladies... um, You looked a little bit at the priest this past week as well, and I'm not going to really focus in on that, but I just want you to notice when you looked at the duties of the priest and the clothing of the priest, God was very specific, was he not? And what were they clothed in? White linen, right? They were clothed in white linen, which was a picture of the sanctifying work of God who covered them so that they could come into his presence to minister to him in the tabernacle. Now, we know as believers, we are clothed in what? The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are literally clothed in righteousness. Those are the garments of salvation that Marge mentioned. And if you think about it in Revelation 19, when Jesus is coming back on that white horse and the saints are coming with them, the scripture is very explicit. How will we be dressed? In white linen. Why? Because we now are priests of the Most High. Peter tells us that we have become a kingdom of priests. If you're a believer and you're in Christ Jesus, you now have the status of priest. And if you remember, you had to be born into the priestly family to be a priest. When you come to Jesus Christ, you are born again into the family of God, into the lineage of the high priest, Jesus Christ. So you now are a priest That's why when you come before the Lord and you intercede and you minister to the Lord just as the priests of old did, you are welcomed into his presence. And we can come at any time, not just on the Day of Atonement. We are welcome now because that veil has been torn from top to bottom and we can come boldly or confidently into the very presence of God because we are covered. We are now priests of the Most High and we are accepted into his presence. You know, Jesus, when he was praying for us in the high priestly prayer, said, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. John 17, 17. And the Greek word for sanctify literally means to hallow, to set apart. It means to withdraw from fellowship with the world and from selfishness by first gaining fellowship with God and toward God. And you've heard that before, that to be sanctified means to be set apart. We are literally now saints because we are in Christ. So we are to live differently from the world and it tells us that we are sanctified in his truth and his word is truth there is no truth apart from his word if it doesn't line up with the word of God it's not true God has given us everything we need to know for life and godliness scripture tells us well as we looked at Exodus this past week in Exodus 30 we saw the instructions for the labor how the priests were to wash before they ministered to the Lord, their hands and their feet. But we know when they were anointed and dedicated to the Lord, they were completely immersed, which is a beautiful picture of baptism for us. But they were to cleanse their hands and their feet before coming into the presence of the Lord. Why is that? Because just like us, even though they'd been washed, just like we've been washed in salvation, we still accumulate daily dirt being out in the world, don't we? And that's why when we come to the Word of God, God uses His Word to cleanse us. And maybe we've picked up a wrong idea or a lie, something that's not true or a a skewed perspective on something. And we come to the word of God and God aligns our perspective so that we now have a kingdom perspective and we're seeing clearly and accurately. And so he uses his word to wash over us so that we see as he sees. In Exodus 38, 8, 
It says, moreover, he made the labor of bronze with its base of bronze from the mirrors of the serving women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So we know the labor was made of bronze mirrors. So what would that have been like? I mean, think about it. It's a bronze mirror with water. Water already reflects you. But as they've been offering the sacrifices, not only would it be a reflection to them, but the water would become bloodied, would it not? Because they're cleansing their hands in that. And yet they would see reflection of themselves. And we know from Scripture that the Word of God is also cleansing like water, the washing of the water of the word, but it also is a reflection. And James 1 tells us that we're not to be like the natural man who quickly looks into the mirror of God's word and leaves and forgets what he looks like, but instead we are to gaze intently into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, to gaze intently, to really meditate upon the word of God so that we see clearly not just God, but also ourselves, right? So I've got a little illustration that I wanted to use this morning. I have two teacups up here. And I brought these teacups because I want us to talk about what it means to immerse ourselves in the Word of God. It is not a quick dipping, okay? I'm going to pour hot water into both of these little cups. And this teapot and cups were a gift to me from one of my mission trips when I went to Romania. So it's very special. Now, I'm, you know... Bible study, okay? We come to Bible study. We're dipping, right? You were in church Sunday morning. We'll get another dip. Oh, you also went to life group. Okay, another dip, right? But if you're not reading the Word of God every day and immersing yourself in it, you're not going to be changed by it. Let's say you read the Bible maybe twice a week. So you dip again, right? Okay, that's your dip for the week. Now, suppose... You not only come to church Sunday and to life group and to Bible study, but every single day you're spending time immersed in the Word of God. So we're going to let that little tea bag steep. Um, and actually, I looked up online how long tea bags are supposed to steep, and it depends on the type of tea it is. You know, it's anywhere from two to six minutes, depending upon the tea. But we're going to let that steep while we're digging into the Word of God, and we're going to look at the difference in those two cups of tea when we finish. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, 1 through 14, well actually in verse 14, that we're to pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. So the scripture is very clear that we are to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be hallowed. We talked last week about how we are to pursue holiness um, and it literally requires discipline. When Paul was writing to Timothy, his son in the ministry, in 1 Timothy 4, 7, he said, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So we are to be godly or holy, set apart to the Lord. Last week, we saw that Paul encouraged the Corinthians to train like an athlete. And he said he disciplines or buffets his body and makes it his slave. Disciplining ourselves to be in the word of God is one of the primary disciplines in the pursuit of godliness. Donald Whitney has redone his great book, Spiritual Disciplines, and I highly recommend it. It's called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. And in it he said, disciplines are things you do, such as read, meditate, pray, fast, worship, serve, learn, and so on. The goal of practicing a given discipline, of course, is not about doing as much as it is about being. That is, being like Jesus. But the biblical way to grow in being more like Jesus is through the rightly motivated doing of the biblical spiritual disciplines. And remember, we've talked about that, that it is not about our doing, but it is about being. And as we become more like Jesus, the doing flows out of the being. Then we are about the Father's business for us. We are completing His plan and purpose for our lives because we are being who He's called us to be, and we're spending time in His presence so that He can call us and commission us. So how do we do that? How do we immerse ourselves in the Word of God? Well, there are several ways that we do it. One of them is just to hear the Word. Um, scripture, Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So as we hear the word of God, we are strengthened because we know the Bible is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So it is beneficial for us to hear the word of God read, spoken, taught, preached. And I encourage you to find ways to do it outside of just Sunday morning. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, 
For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So what did the Lord tell us? He said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We are interconnected because once you become a believer, you become a part of the body of Christ. Now, body is all connected. Last time I checked, it works best when all the parts are still (laughs) connected, right? So we cannot live as a Lone Ranger Christian. God did not design us to live that way. Because we are created in his image, part of that means we are created to be relational. And so God wants us first in right relationship with him and then in proper relationship with others. But that comes first with our vertical relationship with him. And when that relationship is right, is solid, is intimate, then we're able to be right in our horizontal relationships regardless of how the other people respond or react. We're able to love them. We're able to not be defeated, discouraged, have our joy stolen by someone. You realize that's a choice, right? You get to choose to allow somebody to steal your joy. You can't say, well, they upset me so bad. You allowed yourself to get upset. (laughs) If you're going to love like Christ did and you're dead to the flesh, you're not going to be easily offended. And if that is true, then you're going to be in right relationship as much as it depends upon you with your horizontal relationships as well. So I want to ask you this morning, how much time could you redeem so that you could hear the word of God more often? And I don't know about you, but um, I... I love listening to podcasts of various preachers and teachers. In fact, I would highly recommend the Gospel Coalition. They had a women's conference this past summer, and you can just Google that or go to their website. All of the women who taught this summer, all their things are on there. They're free. Um, I listened to Paige Brown. She did a phenomenal job. Um, They're teaching out of Nehemiah, but they're also breakout sessions. All the breakout sessions were recorded. Earphones, little case, clip it on. When I'm working out in the yard, when I'm working around the house, when I'm ironing. You know, it's kind of fun to reward yourself when you don't enjoy doing something. Like, I do not enjoy ironing. It's just one of my least favorite things to do. And so when I iron, I reward myself by listening to a podcast I've been really wanting to listen to. Or when I'm exercising, I'll put on a podcast. And I love that I can use my Kindle. It's easier to read the Word as well when I'm on the treadmill or I'm on the elliptical. Because on the Kindle, you just touch it and turn the page. You don't have to worry about it falling off. It kind of sits right up there on that little, that little rack on my treadmill or my elliptical. I want to hear the Word of God, and there are apps where you can listen to the Word of God, I encourage you, find ways to increase the time that you hear the Word of God. Why? Because faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. Utilize the time that you're in your car. So hear the Word of God, but then also we need to read the Word of God. And this is where we're really going to immerse ourselves in it as we're self-feeding. We're reading it for ourselves. And I encourage you to have a, a systematic plan for reading through the Word of God. In John 15, 3, the Lord said to his disciples, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So as you're hearing the word, as you're reading the word, God is using it to cleanse you. That's how our minds are renewed. Our minds are renewed through the word of God. Wrong ways of thinking, wrong motives, wrong attitudes will be revealed as we're reading the word of God and looking intently into his perfect law. Once again, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Matthew Henry said, the word of Christ is spoken to them. There is a cleansing virtue in that word as it works grace and works out corruption. Now, about a week and a half ago, I was getting ready to go out of town. And you know how when you're getting ready to go out of town, it's amazing what you can accomplish, is it not? (laughs) If I was that effective and productive all the time, I'd probably be dead. But um, (laughs) we'd kill ourselves. But I could really get a lot done. I have a picture of a rose Uh, one of my rose bushes, and it was covered in dead blooms like this. Now, what do you have to do so that the rose bush will continue to bloom? You have to cut those dead blooms off. It's called deadheading your rose bush. Now, why do you do that? So that the bush is not concentrating all of its strength Uh, and nourishment on creating seeds, but instead creating new blooms. So I took my little clippers, and I was out there clipping off all of those dead buds, I was deadheading my rose bushes, and literally, in just a week and a half, this is a picture of that rose bush. Now, is that not amazing that it it bloomed that fast? I was gone and came back, and I thought, this is going to be an experiment, Lord. (laughs) I want to see how many blooms are on this rose bush. Do you realize that's what the Lord does in our life? As we read the word of God and he begins to reveal things to us that are sinful, 
and we confess them and he cleanses us, what is he doing? He's allowing the sin to come to the top so that he can purge us of it, so that it can be removed. As we acknowledge it and say, yes, Lord, this is sin, and we confess it, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when he does that, we are able to bear through his spirit flowing through us a greater level of fruit. There will be greater fruitfulness in your life. You will be more effective eternally, not just in the temporal but you will be investing in the kingdom and doing those things that really matter and bearing fruit of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God flows through you. Sometimes God allows events to come into our life and our response or reaction <laughs> shows us what's on the inside. And any time we have to have something more than Jesus, he's allowing us to see we've allowed an idol to get onto our heart. Whether it's the health of our children the well-being of our marriage, a rebellious child, the death of a loved one, anything we want more than we want intimacy with Jesus has become an idol. And God allows things to come into our lives to break us, to purge us, to reveal ourselves to us so that we see what it is we really value. Lord, do I really love you with all of my heart, soul, mind and strength and it has gotten eerily quiet in here why it hits home doesn't it we're women we're all about relationships and it's very difficult for us to not put our children on that pedestal and to say lord i want my children to love you and you know what that's a great thing but if your child rebels you don't turn against god you don't you're not devastated Yes, you grieve. Yes, you pray. Yes, you stand in the gap. But you're not devastated. Why? Because your greatest hope is Jesus Christ, and he loves your child more than you do. And as you pray and as you stand in the gap, you know God is going to be moving and working on their behalf. But you have to release them to the Lord as you stand in the gap and as you pray. And Jesus Christ still must be the greatest love. He must have that preeminent spot in your heart. And we have to ask ourselves and be honest as we immerse ourselves in his word. God, is my passion for you, my love to know you. As I open your word, am I expecting to hear from you? Do I love you most? It, it'll be evident in how we approach his word and how we spend our time with him. Ezra 7.10. Not only are we hearing the word and reading the word, we need to study the word. And in Ezra 7.10 it says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinance, ordinances in Israel. When Steve and I first went to seminary, um, we, he was taking a scripture memory class at the church that we were attending, South Cliff Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. And I was learning them with him, but I was actually taking a sign language class at the time. So we would sit out on the back porch, and I would review scriptures with him. And a lot of them we would put to music, silly little goofy tunes that we made up just to help us remember the verses. And Ezra 7.10 was one of those. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments, Ezra Seven, ten. That is such an easy thing to do with your children. If you are memorizing scripture yourself, put it to music. And there are so many great now script, you know, scripture CDs. I know when my kids were little, I think it was We Sing, something like that. And they did the books of the Bible to song. My whole family still sings it. In fact, Grant, our son, who has a PhD in theology from Southern Seminary and teaches Old Testament and New Testament for Union University, has his students memorize the books of the Bible with the song. And Bethany was laughing one day. She said, Mom, you're not going to believe this. Grant's whole class is singing that song we sang when we were kids. But they learn it because so many of them don't know the books of the Bible. They've never memorized them. And you put it to music, they've got it. They get it. They don't forget it. In fact, all of my children could sing to you the books of the Bible when they were three or four years old because I was singing it with them and helping them to remember it. So that's one of the ways not only do you immerse yourself in the Word, but you immerse your family in the Word. But what was the first thing it tells us Ezra did? He set his heart. <laughs> he chose. He decided. He set his heart upon it. What have you set your heart upon? Have you set your heart upon really knowing God, upon really knowing his will? Because it is an in act of our will to set our heart, our affections upon him. And then we're to study. Once we've set our heart upon him, then we study. And it is then to those who seek him, what, with their whole heart that God reveals himself. So as you set your heart upon him, he begins to reveal himself to you because as we all know, the Bible is not just for those who want to come and learn facts. The Bible is a living, written revelation of God. And he reveals himself on deeper levels to those who seek him with their whole heart. Truths the casual observer will never get, will never see. 
You've got to come to him with your whole heart and choose to study the word of God. And then to do what? To actually do it. Not just to know what we're supposed to do, but to do it. And I have found the Lord makes me flesh out what I'm studying. It is interesting if I'm studying a specific topic, it's like the Lord allows things to come into my life to test me on this to see if I'm going to be patient, if I'm going to be loving at all times, or if I'm going to respond in the flesh or the spirit, if I'm teaching on living the spirit-filled life. The Lord's going to test me. He's allowing things to come into my life to let me evaluate, am I really doing it? Am I really practicing what I'm professing? Is it a reality in my life? And I want it to be a reality in my life. So he practiced it, and then he taught it. So what do we see? We've got to set our heart on it first. Then we study, and then we do. We practice what God reveals to us in our study of his word, and then we're ready to teach it to somebody else. And I would encourage you that what you're learning now will really become yours if you will turn around and teach it to somebody else. That's when you get it. When you can articulate it to someone else, you've got it. it, it those truths become yours. R.C. Sproul said this, Here then is the real problem of our negligence because biblical illiteracy is a huge issue in our day. We fail in our duty to study God's word, not so much because it's difficult to understand, not so much because it's dull and boring, but because it's work. (laughs) Our problem is not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. Our problem is that we are lazy. Ooh, that's an indictment, is it not? We do what we want to do, don't we? And the Bible is not too difficult to understand because Jesus has given us his spirit who dwells within us, who will teach us, the Bible says, everything we need to know. If we apply ourselves to it, if we turn to him and and seek him. But some of us simply don't want to align ourselves with the truth that we see in God's word. So how, how do we read and study the Bible? You need to have a plan. You need to have a specific plan. And I brought my little toolkit with me again and actually brought a... Hebrew Greek keyword study Bible because this is a great tool to use in studying the Word of God. The keywords in scripture verses are underlined and they have a little Strong's Concordance number. You can turn to that number in the back, whether Old or New Testament, and get a, a more in depth definition of that particular word, which is what I shared with you about sanctification that came out of this Bible. Um, it will really help you in your study of the Word of God and help you really grasp the truths that God is revealing to us through his word. So have a plan to read through the word of God and then read expectantly. God's word is God breathed and it is still breathing. And when the spirit of God and his word connects with the spirit of God in you, there's revelation. You get it. You see truth that you've missed before because the Holy Spirit begins to show you through spirit eyes truths about the Lord. And then have a pen and paper available. Have a way to underline things that really step, you know, seem to just jump off the page. They stand out for you. Um, Underline them. Write down what God is showing you on a journal or a piece of paper. And then use cross-references. Follow cross-references and see other places where that word has been used. And utilize free resources. I've got a list of them. They're on your handout there. But um, BibleGateway.com is a great free internet resource. And you can look up all kinds of scripture verses. There are free commentaries on there. You can you know, look at parallel translations side by side. I mean, it's, it's really an effective tool and costs you nothing. So I encourage you to utilize it. And then you have all kinds of Bible apps. And I just listed a few of them. I know I probably haven't come close. There's no telling how many of them there are out there. But these are ones I have utilized. Bible.is is a great way to listen to the Word of God. And that you can do it with drama. It's got music and different voices. I mean, it really is an effective way to listen to the Word of God. And then Version Bible is a great study tool. Blue Letter Bible is another one. Logos Bible is one. And then Olive Tree Bible Study. And this is actually a picture. I did a screenshot of my phone. Um, Olive Tree. These are the different reading plans that they have available. So say you don't have a one-year Bible or a one-year chronological Bible. There are so many reading plans you can choose from. You can just hit one of those. It'll be on your phone. It'll tell you exactly what you're supposed to read. Um, McShane's uh, guide is excellent. It takes you through the Old Testament once the New Testament and Psalms twice every year. I've used that one before. Just check some of these out and utilize some of these methods to have a plan for reading through the Word of God every year. So we're going to hear it, we're going to read it, we're going to study it, but we also need to meditate upon it. And I encourage you to keep three by five cards in your quiet time space. I have a couple of them in here that I I utilize and I 
will pull these out and when a verse jumps off the page at me, I take these out, I write it down, I put it in here, I throw it in my purse. Sometimes I keep it in the car. If I'm going to be in the car and I'll review those scriptures, put it on three by five card, tape it on your mirror. Review it as you're getting ready in the morning. Um, share it with your family. Say, hey, this is a verse the Lord really has used to speak to me in my personal time with the Lord. Let's all memorize it together. And if you will meditate upon it, phrase by phrase, you will be shocked at how the Lord will speak to you and how he will open up truths to you that maybe you've missed before in a casual reading of that verse. But as you're meditating on it, suddenly you'll see something you've missed before or maybe your connection with another verse that God's been using to speak to you. So highlight the verses in your Bible, meditate phrase by phrase. You know, in Joshua, in fact, turn your Bibles to Joshua 1 and let's look at verses 8 and 9. God had given Moses the first five books of the Bible. He had been the one that had been the spokesperson for Moses. And now Joshua was chosen to go in and lead the people into the promised land. Can you imagine how heavy that responsibility was and how inadequate he felt not being Moses? I mean, he had accompanied Moses up on the mountain. He'd experienced the presence of God, but God hadn't taken him further still alone. He had experienced God. He'd been discipled by Moses, but still he wasn't Moses. So what did God say to him in verses 8 and 9? He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now I want you to know that is a word for us today. When we look out at our world and what's going on even in our own culture, Sometimes we want to tremble or be dismayed, don't we? But God says, oh no, if you will meditate upon my word day and night, you will not forget that I am with you wherever you go and that I am in control. And you can trust him and you will not fear. Anytime, remember, fear comes into your heart, faith and fear cannot coexist in the human heart. So if fear is coming in, it's pushing out faith. We're not trusting God. So it's one of those red flags that says, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Back up. Get rid of the fear. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. Those things happen when we meditate upon the word of God. And he also tells us in Psalm 119, 105, that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. As you meditate upon the word of God, God's going to give you light for that next step. He's going to speak to you and open up a way for you when you're praying and you're lifting specific requests up to him. And then memorize the word. And I would just encourage you to have a plan. There are a lot of plans out there for memorizing the word. Or you can just choose verses that God uses to speak to you and put them on your 3 by 5 cards and begin to memorize those. But it is most effective when you've got a partner to do it with. It's most effective when you've got some accountability. Because we can, if you're like me, I have have great <laughs> ambitions of memorizing tons of scripture and my husband convicts me because he is constantly memorizing scripture so it challenges me and spurs me on but it, when I have somebody else that I'm memorizing scripture with and I know okay we're going to ask each other these verses it makes me stay with it it makes me think about it every day and practice those verses because one of the keys is just consistency just reviewing learning a phrase at a time learn the first phrase Add a second, say the two phrases together, add the next phrase until you get that, in, that verse down and you know where it's found. Why? Every word of God is important and you want to memorize it word for word and know where you found it because God will call upon you to share that. There will be times when you're talking to someone else that, oh, that verse will be perfect for what you're dealing with or the struggle that you're having right now. Let me share with you a verse God used in my own life and you need to be able to tell them where that verse is. Okay, it's time to check our teacups. I brought clear glasses because I want to pour it in so you can actually see from the teacup. Okay, this is the one that we dipped. Here's the one that we steeped. What's the difference in the two glasses? <laughs> yeah, one's richer, darker colors changed, stronger smell. In fact, this one doesn't smell like anything. This is blueberry flavored tea. It smells really good. <laughs> okay, they're going to taste different too, are they not? This one's going to taste like water. This one's going to have a blueberry tea flavor to it because the tea bag was allowed to steep in the water. 
when you immerse yourself into the water of the word, into the labor of God's word, he will change you. You're going to look different. You're going to smell different. You're going to have the aroma of Christ about you. And you're going to taste different. In fact, you're going to be so salty that you are going to cause others to want to have a taste of him as well. They're going to be drawn to Jesus in you because you are different from the world. Why? You've been sanctified, hallowed, set apart for relationship with God. No longer living like the world, but living like a citizen of heaven with a kingdom agenda on mission for the Most High. And that, my friends, sets you apart. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, how we thank you that everything you've included in your word is important. Every little detail is significant. And, Father, we thank you that as we've looked at the tabernacle now, just the first two articles, we are amazed at how they point to Jesus Christ and how he is the fulfillment of all that it depicted. Lord, we ask that through your spirit, you would so teach us in your word and you would increase our hunger to be in your word and to know you that we might walk intimately with you and talk with you and be changed by you so that we look and smell and see like Jesus. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen.